Okay. So uh, I guess we can start the um, the suttas uh, for today. Yeah. So um, we're going to continue with the uh, sutta we were dealing with yesterday, which is the um, uh, the uh, Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, the sutta on mindfulness directed to the body. And we're going to finish that one off and see what happens towards the end. Uh, and just to uh, give you just a quick reminder of the things we were covering yesterday, we were looking at the uh, idea of mindfulness directed to the body, and especially where it fits on the path of the Buddhist practice. Uh, and uh, the idea of the sutta is that uh, it is a lot of it is preliminary practices that lead up to meditation practice. Uh, we had a look yesterday at the idea of a clear comprehension, full awareness, or also called situational awareness. Sati Sampajanya in Pali. We had a look at the four postures, and these are all the preliminary exercise that lead to the idea of meditation practice. And for this reason, they are very useful, and they are, but it's important to understand where they actually fit on the Buddhist path. Then we had a look uh, also yesterday at the 31 parts of the body. We also had a quick look at the uh, initial stages of mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. And uh, all of this, this is where we're getting closer to real meditation practice. Yeah, The 31 parts of the body is there to help us to let go of the world uh, to some extent. Uh, and then, of course, then uh, the mindfulness of breathing, the real meditation happens from there. Uh, so um, I'm going to continue from there. I am um, Okay, so uh, this is where we came up to Yesterday, we had a look at the uh, 31 parts of the body, and now comes the next kind of important meditation exercise, which is the four elements. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the uh, idea of the four elements is often more useful for people than the 31 parts of the body, because it is a bit more neutral. It is not as kind of in your face, looking at the impurities, etc. But it's more a neutral way of understanding the body just as a natural phenomenon, not something that belongs to you, not something you can control, uh, but as something that belongs to the world. Uh, and in this way, it is a very useful exercise to reduce the attachments to the body. Uh, and this is something that I think a lot of people can use if they, if they wish. Uh, Excuse me, Achan. Yeah. yeah. There's some echo in your, your voice. There's an echo in my voice. Yeah. Is it still there? I think it's still there. It is still there. Okay. Uh, not sure why that is the case. That's a little strange. Um, And uh, okay, let me just try to. Okay, how is that? Is that any better or is it still the same? Is it a feedback or? Uh... Uh, I think we continue for now. Looks, yeah. Sounds a bit better. Okay, let's let's see what happens. I'm I'm not an, I'm not I'm not expert on these things, so I'm I'm just sort of. Uh, <laughs> fumbling around to get this right. So it's, uh, let's see what happens. So, so uh, this is how the uh, Buddha describes this idea of uh, uh, the four elements. Uh, yeah, so we have the paragraph here. It says, furthermore, a mendicant examines their own body, whatever its placement or posture, according to the elements. Uh, in this body, there is the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. So this is uh, uh, just another way of thinking about the body. And of course, the point here is that these elements that you see here, these are the natural elements of the world around us. 
yeah, the earth element that is like the, the solid aspect of the body, uh, and it's very it's exactly the same as the solid aspect of the world around us. Uh, the body that we have is just part of the world. It doesn't, it's not really differentiated from the world. Uh, and uh, once you start to see this equivalence of the body and the world, uh, it's easier to uh, let go of the body because you understand it's not really something that is inherently yours. It comes and goes with nature. It arises out of, in a sense, it arises out of uh, natural phenomena. Yeah, it, the way, the reason we have this body is because we eat food. The food comes from outside. It is part of the world. And then we build up the body out of this food. Uh, that is really the earth element. Uh, and of course, when you die, it goes back to the earth again. Uh, and uh, all the time throughout life, there is also an exchange. We breathe all the time, we, uh, all of these kind of things. And there is an exchange between us and the world outside. Or you have things falling off your body. Yeah? Sometimes the skin, bits of skin may fall off, etc. So there is this constant exchange. And we are no different from the earth element or the world outside of us. At the water element, uh, uh, this is all the liquid aspect of the body. Whatever is liquid in the body is the same as the liquid aspect, aspect of the world. Uh, that's where it comes from. Uh, that is where it returns to. Uh, the fire element, well, that's the heat of the body. Uh, yeah, so the body is always uh, warmer than the, it tends to be warmer than the uh, world outside. Uh, so there's like an internal element of heat in the body. Uh, and that is, again, similar to the heat and the cold in the world outside. Uh, and then you have the air elements. This is the airy aspects of the body, the breath or whatever else it is that is airy in the body. It is like the air outside. Uh, so the world, the body comes out of the world. It arises out of these world elements. It always passes back to these elements when eventually you pass away. The body is like the world. The world is like the body. There's nothing in this body that is, you can really control at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it will just go according to the phenomena of the world in exactly the same way. And this is very useful when you start to see that. You start to see the impersonality of this body. You start to understand how tied up it is with the laws of the universe, the laws that govern material phenomena, all of these kind of things, how it comes and goes. And in the end, you kind of let go a little bit when you understand the nature of the body in this way. And this is the idea behind this and then there is a, a simile here to explain them what is going on. And it says, it is as if a deft butcher or a butcher's apprentice were to kill a cow and sit down at the crossroads with the meat cut into portions. Yeah, so you, it's like the cow is cut up into portions. In the same way, you can kind of see the body as having these various portions or various characteristics. We can take all the water out and put it in one pile, all the solid out, put it in one pile, all the air out, put it in one pile. The heat, I don't know if you can put the heat or the fire in a pile, but you, know, you get the rough idea that the fire too has a kind of, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it has a certain... Um, separateness to it that you can somehow maybe single out from the rest of the body, the fire part of the body. So you see the body in this way, uh, no inherent essence, not under your control, belonging to the world, subject to the laws of the universe, just like all other matter happens to be. Uh. In the same way, a mendicant examines their own body. Uh, whatever the placement and posture, according to the elements. Uh, in this body, there is the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. Uh, yeah, so here again, we have this idea of examining, and the Pali word for examining again is pacha be, pacha dekati, which means not just looking at the body. Uh, it doesn't mean just observing the body, but it means using like, like your imagination. It's an examination. And here we obviously have to use our examination again to really, or our imagination to understand what is going on. Uh, 
It is not just a pure practice of observation, but it's actually thinking about the body, examining it in this way, and then making a comparison with the earth element outsider. And all of this needs a little bit of uh, thinking, a bit of reflecting, yeah, a bit of um, imag imagining how, what the body actually is like. Yeah. So again, it's this important point that in Buddhism, everything is not about observation. Yeah. A large part of the Buddhist practice is about using the mind to reflect, to contemplate, to imagine, to infer, yeah, to understand what is going on based on not immediate experience, but a further development of uh, understanding in your, in your own mind and in your own experience. Uh, so um, again, this word examine, which is a very interesting word in the Pali, Pachavekati, um, because it is used throughout the suttas, uh, and uh, it is used to the idea of uh, reflecting about things. Uh, and we'll maybe we'll come back to a bit more about how this reflection actually happens uh, in a variety of contexts. And then you have this idea that whatever the placement or the posture of the body, yeah, the body always has this nature. This is the way the body is uh, by nature, and it's not something that will change or will be different uh, depending on the, on where you are or what you're doing or uh, you know it's always that nature of the body and sometimes we get a bit intoxicated with the body this is the nature of life to get intoxicated with the body yeah you view your body as beautiful or attractive or you're attached to it and all of these kind of things uh, and this degree of attachment that you have to the body, the degree of delight that you have in the body will vary depending on what you are doing and where you are. It will vary depending on the placement and posture, if you like, of the body. But regardless of the placement and posture, regardless of what you're doing, regardless of whether you are being intoxicated by the body or not, whether you delight in this body, yay, my body, my body is so wonderful. <laughs> regardless of that, it is always a built up of the four elements. Uh, so the four elements can kind of ground you, yeah, give you that evenness of the mind uh, where you don't get kind of too taken away by the by these uh, false infatuations and intoxications uh, that we often have. Uh, and uh, you may wonder, when should you be doing this kind of uh, practice? And of course, this kind of practice can be done at any time, really, if you want to. But it can also be useful to do as an entry point to meditation practice. Yeah? If you find that you are you know, generally maybe a bit too attached to the body or whatever, you can use this as like a beginning exercise in meditation to remind yourself of the nature of this body. Yeah? But actually, it does not really belong to you. It is belongs to the world. It is part of the world at large. And then you become less interested because you know that ultimately, actually, you have to give it all up. And it kind of has to return to nature again. So it can be used at the beginning of meditation to neutralize your attachment to these things. And if that works, it can take your meditation deeper, yeah, because you are, again, the idea of detaching from the world is an important part of this. Uh, so through that detachment, then uh, you let go of this. Uh, and uh, so this is, um, uh, this, this is how it can be used, or it can be used also even in daily life, yeah, if you want to just, uh, you can just remind yourself very quickly of the four elements to kind of... Uh, cool down any attachment that you may have. And then uh, the Buddha says, as they meditate like this, uh, here it is more like a real meditation, or it can be as you live like this, keeping the elements in mind, the diligent or the heedful, if you like, heedful, inspired, and, uh, uh, en and energetic, maybe. Memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up. The mind becomes still internally. It settles, unifies, uh, and becomes immersed in samadhi. That too is how a monastic develops the mindfulness of the body. So um, again, doing this practice in the right way, ultimately it takes you all the way to samadhi. But uh, remember that what we are seeing here is... Um, 
not the full practice. Uh, yeah, it is usually not enough just to do the elements. The elements is a useful practice to give you a little bit of more distance. Yeah, but it's not usually enough in its own right. You usually do you do the element meditation. You combine that with doing the breath meditation later on. Yeah, and then when you have this combination of different approaches, starting with the elements, moving on to the breath, that is usually how you attain these states of samadhi. So uh, remember that these are not complete descriptions very often. They are just kind of the main source that overcomes defilements, overcomes detachments, uh, and enables you then to uh, achieve and practice that mindfulness of the breath afterwards. Uh, so I should maybe point out also that memories and thoughts of the lay life uh, are given up. This does not mean that these kind of practices are only for monastics. They're also for lay people. Yeah. The point is just that the typical thoughts and memories of lay life are kind of abandoned a little bit. Yeah. So all of you, if you are practicing this path, you're kind of already leaving some of the trappings of lay life a little bit behind. Yeah. You are still a lay person, perhaps, but it doesn't mean that you are fully involved in that lay life because you're already maybe keeping some precepts. Sometimes you're going on retreat. Yeah. So you're already moving a little bit in the direction of being a meditator and being someone who's taking this path very seriously. So this just means that you are leaving some aspects of lay life behind. It doesn't mean that you're no longer a lay person. Huh? And uh, so just to be clear about that. Huh? So to uh, discuss the um, four element meditation a bit more, I will come back uh, later on today to look at what is called the greater sutta on the elephant's footprint. Huh? The Mahahati Padopama Sutta in Pali is a very uh, nice sutta, and it talks about the element meditation in great detail. So I'll come back to this later on, just to describe in a bit more detail how this actually works, uh, so as to get some more feeling for this. Uh. So that is the uh, fifth uh, way uh, of doing the mindfulness of the body, yeah, the kaya gata sati, the mindfulness directed at the body. Now we're going to move on to the next one. And the next one is a more challenging. This is the meditation on the corpse, yeah. <laughs> so this, maybe one of the things I should say straight away before we start actually talking about the corpse meditation, is that this is a very minor kind of meditation in the suttas. It only occurs in a very few places in the suttas. It occurs here, it occurs in the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, where probably it does not belong in the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, but it does occur here in this particular sutta. But because it is a minor thing, it is not something that really we need to emphasize in our meditation. I'm going to read it out simply for completion, yeah, so that we can see all the aspects of mindfulness going to the body. But I would not normally recommend this for anyone to do this kind of meditation. If you are really interested and you are attracted to this and you think it might be helpful, you can try it. But it is not something that I would normally recommend anyone to do because it is just too disgusting yeah, for many people. And if it is very disgusting and very negative, it can actually have very bad consequences. Yeah, You can end up being really fed up with the body and you can have all kind of negative feelings about yourself, just a little bit like the 31 parts of the body, but here it's even worse, even more challenging. So um, be very careful with these kind of meditation practices. Having said that, I'm going to go through it anyway, just to give you a feeling for all the different aspects of the body contemplation as it is uh, taught in this particular sutta. So this is what the Buddha has to say. Furthermore, suppose a mendicant were to see a corpse discarded in a charnel ground, and it had been dead for one, two, or three days, bloated, livid, and festering. They compare it with their own body, 
this body, in other words, my body, is also of the same nature, the same kind, and cannot go beyond that. As they meditate or dwell like this, uh, hateful, inspired, and energetic, uh, memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up. Uh, their mind becomes stilled internally, it settles, uh, unifies, and becomes immersed in samadhi. That too is how mendicant develops mindfulness of the body. So here we have the idea of the corpse yeah, discarded in a charnel ground. And a charnel ground is a place where you tend to throw a corpse aside. The charnel ground is often a place where you will burn the corpses, uh, yeah? And you find that there are still uh, countries in Asia, uh, particularly in Asia, where there's still this practice is still happening to the present day. Uh, and, uh, you know, Ajahn Brahm always tells that uh, the story at, in Wat Nanachat, uh, the monastery he was in Thailand, uh, they actually had a charnel ground. So corpses were actually burned inside the monastery. Uh, yeah, and this was one of the benefits of uh, kind of being a monastic or having a charnel ground in a monastery, and you could watch the burning of the corpses in the monastery. Uh, that was considered a very beneficial for a monk at that time and in, in Thailand. So very lucky to have a charnel ground right there in the monastery. Uh, I don't know how you feel about having a charnel ground in your if you have a garden in your little garden plot, but that would be a good idea. But uh, this is what kind of uh, was considered a good thing for monastics in Thailand. So you have a charnel ground there, and then you have the bodies. Yeah? And some of the bodies, uh, they are just left there. And because they are left there, you can see the process of decomposition. Yeah? It's been dead for one, two, or three days, bloated. Yeah? When a corpse starts to decompose, it starts to expand, it bloats. Uh, it is livid. Livid means that it is kind of changing its color. It's becoming like bluish, bluish kind of color when it starts to decompose. And festering is the idea of the decomposition itself, yeah, which is gradually happening at this particular point of view. So you're observing this, and then you know that your body has the same nature. Yeah, your body will be just like that. And that can be quite challenging yeah, to remember that. Uh, and it can really be off-putting to think of your body in that particular way. Uh, and that's why I say, be very careful with these kind of meditations that may end up having a negative impact on you rather than a positive impact. Uh, so know what you're doing if you want to do this kind of thing. So, so um, you see your body in this way. And of course, uh, uh, at Bodhinyana Monastery, sometimes we also see these things because we have nature around us all the time here at Bodhinyana Monastery. So we see animals, uh, you know, like kangaroos, for example, when they die, this is exactly what you see. And it is quite uh, disgusting to see the process of decomposition, to be honest. Uh, but uh, if you do this in the right way, it leads to a detachment from the body. It means you are less passionate about the body. It enables you to deepen your meditation practice. Uh, and of course, the consequence of that eventually is that you can attain some sort of samadhi because of that. Uh, and this is how this then works. Uh, starting with the corpse, going towards the mindfulness of breathing, and eventually attaining samadhi from that. Or suppose they were to see a corpse discarded on a charnel ground, being devoured by crows, hawks, vultures, herons, dogs, tigers, leopards, and jackals, uh, and many kinds of little creatures. Uh, they will compare it with their own body. This body is also of the same nature, uh, that same kind, and cannot go beyond that. Uh, that too is how mendicant develops mindfulness of body. Uh, cannot go beyond that means that uh, you are subject to that. You cannot avoid this future. That's really what that means. Cannot go beyond that. Uh, anatita. So you have the same nature. Yeah. If uh, you might, your body might be eaten by all of these animals. Uh, 
uh, because animals are always desperate to get some food, and this is what happens as a consequence. Furthermore, suppose they were to see a corpse discarded in a trauma ground, a skeleton with flesh and blood held together by sinews. Yeah, so this is where everything has decomposed, everything has been eaten, and all that is left is a skeleton. Or furthermore, suppose they were to see a corpse discarded in a charnel ground, a skeleton without flesh, but smeared with blood and held together by sinews. Or furthermore, suppose they were to see a corpse discarded in a charnel ground, a skeleton rid of flesh and blood, uh, held together by sinews. Uh, or bones without sinews are scattered in every direction. Here a hand bone, there a foot bone, here a shin bone, here a thigh bone, here a hip bone, here a rib bone, here a back bone, here an arm bone, here a neck bone, here a jaw bone, here a tooth, there a skull. Or, continuing on, white bones, the color of shells, decrepit bones heaped in a pile, bones rotted and crumbled to powder. You will compare that with your own body. This body is also of that same nature, that same kind, and cannot be go beyond this. As they meditate like this, diligent or heedful, inspired and, and energetic memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up. The mind becomes stilled internally. It settles, unifies, and becomes immersed in samadhi. That too is how mendicant develops mindfulness of the body. So you can see here how it is taken all the way to the end of the body, how the body kind of eventually just disappears and disintegrates completely. It is like earth going back to earth, yeah? Ashes going back to the earth, uh, the body disappearing completely. Uh, and eventually it is as if your body never existed at all. Uh, it becomes taken part of the environment. Uh, and then maybe those elements, uh, those things that were, you, were part of your body, then gets taken up by plants or whatever around there, and then someone else, eats those plants, yeah? And what they are eating is the remnants and the ashes, maybe from your body after you die. They take that on board uh, within themselves. Uh, and the cycle just goes on and on and on. Uh, and uh, what that means is that your body right now, yeah, it is actually full, maybe, of the corpses uh, of people, yeah? The <laughs> The corpses of people that decompose completely until there's nothing left, all the elements going back into, into the ground, then being taken up by new plants. You eat those plants, and then the cycle just goes around and around and around in this way. So we are built up out of all of these things yeah, in the world around us. This is kind of one of the consequences of thinking about this thing in the right way. And... Um, if you think about it in that way, it makes the body less interesting, right? It makes the body cheaper. Is that what my body is made of? All of these things that are quite kind of repulsive and not all that interesting, it means you neutralize the desire for the body. So again, that is the um, cemetery contemplation for you or the charnel ground contemplations for you. And... Uh, um, Again, I would not really recommend those unless you are really interested yourself in these kind of things, because it is very challenging and it can lead to the wrong kind of ideas if you do this wrongly. Um, but uh, so uh, those are the main exercises, the main ways of doing the contemplation of the body in terms of the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta. I will finish off the sutta as well, but I will do that afterwards. Let's have a short break, a few minutes of meditation, a bit of Q&A, and then we we'll come back to the rest of the sutta in a few minutes. So, so I will uh, share the screen again. So... It
here we are. Okay, so we have come to the last one of the uh, actual ex exercise. Actually, there is one more, uh, and uh, this may surprise you that there is one more, because the next one here is the four jhanas. The four jhanas are coming up in a second. Uh, and uh, you may wonder why are the four jhanas mentioned here? Uh, the four jhanas are usually beyond the body. Uh, this is our mental experiences. Uh, and you will know maybe through your own meditation practice that the deeper you go in meditation, the more mental the world becomes. Uh, the less awareness there is of the body. It's like the external world, in a sense, is fading away. You become more and more internalized. Uh, so it is strange that the jhanas should be part of the body awareness. Yeah? It doesn't really fit very well. Uh, and uh, I, you will also notice that for each of the exercises that we have seen, uh, it says that they lead up to samadhi. Each one of them leads to samadhi. The purpose of the body contemplation is actually to get you to samadhi. That is what it says everywhere. Uh, so because the purpose of these meditations is you get you to samadhi, it is strange that the jhanas are included because they are samadhi. They are the result of these practices. And uh, the cause and the result cannot be the same thing. So I think that there is a good argument to be made and that, that argument can be extended by looking at the parallels in Chinese translation, all of these things, that the jhanas don't actually belong to this particular sutta. There are some kind of addition that has happened in the course of history, probably very early on in Buddhist history, like maybe two or 300 years after the time of the Buddha, but they don't really belong to this sutta. Uh, Still, let's have a quick look at them. Let's at least read through them just to do the suttas in full. You may have noticed that uh, this time I am reading the complete suttas. Uh, and uh, very often when I do sutta retreats, I just do extracts from suttas. Uh, but this time I'm deliberately doing complete suttas because uh, it gives a more complete picture of what is going on when you have a complete sutta. Yeah, and I, I don't know, personally, I appreciate sometimes being able to read the full thing rather than just having an extract. So just to make a change, yeah, we have to make things differently <laughs> every now and again. I thought having a look at a complete sutta might be interesting. So I'm going to go through the whole rest of the, the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta. So let's see what happens here. Huh? So, uh, furthermore, a mendicant quite secluded from sensual pleasures, uh, secluded from unskillful qualities, enters and remains in the first absorption, uh, which has rapture and bliss born of seclusion while placing the mind and keeping it connected. Uh. So this is the standard description of the first jhana experience. Uh, and uh, you can see the translation here is a bit different from maybe what you are used to. Uh, but I don't really want to discuss the jhanas now because it is a bit premature. So I'm just going to read through it fairly uh, quickly just to get an idea of what is going on. Uh, and then it says they drench, steep, fill and spread their body with rapture and bliss born of seclusion. Uh, there is no part of the body that is not spread with rapture and bliss born of seclusion. It is like when a deft bathroom attendant or the apprentice pours bath powder into a bronze dish, sprinkling it little by little with water. They knead it until the ball of bath powder is soaked and saturated with moisture, spread through inside and out, yet no moisture oozes out. In the same way, they drench, steep, fill, and spread their body with rapture and bliss born of seclusion. There is no part of the body that is not spread with the rapture and bliss born of seclusion. So here you have this idea that the bliss of the jhana states, yeah, the powerful happiness that you get from these uh, amazing states of samadhi that you can have, uh, they permeate your being, they per permeate your personality. Uh, 
One of the strange things here, one of the interesting things here is the idea that it spread, uh, it spread, they spread their body with these things, uh, yeah? So what does that this mean, that you spread your body with the bliss of the jhana states? Uh, if you cannot feel your body in a jhana state, how, how is this possible? Uh, and there's two ways of understanding this. One is to understand that uh, even though you cannot feel your body, it is still drenched, it is still steeped, it is still spread with that rapture. You have the bliss of the hap and happiness of the jhana state. Uh, and then when you come out of the jhana afterwards, uh, you will feel that. You will feel that your body is incredibly relaxed, yeah, really at ease. It feels like you have never really felt your body before after a deep state of samadhi. And that is precisely because it has been drenched, steeped and filled with the rapture and bliss born of these powerful meditation states. Uh, so this is one of the powers of deep samadhi, is the way it affects your body. There is another way of understanding this, and this is to understand that the word body here, the word, word body uh, in the Pali language, kaya, actually does not really mean physical body in the way that we normally think about it. Body here means really more like the sentient body. In other words, it's the body that is capable of experience. Yeah? In the suttas, what you very often find is you find that you have the body on the one hand, and then you have consciousness on the other hand. So the body that we have is what uh, produces or helps produce the other khandhas, yeah? So consciousness is on the one hand, and then you have four other khandhas. You have the khandhas of body, perception, feeling, and will. And those four khandhas are tied up with the body. Yeah, so if you have a human body that will determine to some extent what kind of perceptions you have, what kind of feelings you have, what kind of volition you have, and then there's consciousness that stands apart from those four khandhas. So the body can be understood in Buddhism as um, the sentient body, the body that experiences the world because it determines what kind of experiences you can have in the world. So in the jhana state, what you have is you have a different kind of body. It is still you experiencing these states. It feels like you are there. So the body that you have there is the mind-made body. Yeah, the body which is made by mind, the body which consists of mind. It is not a physical body at all. It is basically just your personality which experiences the jhana state. And one of the great ways of translating the word kaya is actually as personality. Yeah, you personally, personally experience these things. So when it says that it is spread, the whole body is spread, what it means is that your entire experience, your whole personal experience at that point is bliss and rapture, and there's nothing outside of that experience. That is all you have at that particular point. So this is how I would tend to understand this particular passage because it is the only way that it uh, makes sense to me, yeah? And then you have this beautiful simile here for the jhana states, uh, is when you have the bath powder, and the bath powder is completely drenched and saturated with moisture, uh, but there is no moisture. It is all the way through your entire experience. Everything you experience uh, is full of bliss and rapture and all of these kind of things. Uh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, it's very powerful when you see these things. It is so uh, attractive and so kind of, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's something that everyone really would want to do. If you want a good marketing campaign for Samadhi, well, here it is, the marketing campaign is right there. Yeah, it's like this ball and you're completely saturated with the happiness and joy that is inside, but no moisture oozes out. In other words, it is contained within your personal experience. This is your experience, and that is what it contains. Okay. Um, so then the Buddha says, as they meditate like this, heedful, 
um, inspired and energetic memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up. The mind becomes stilled. <laughs> it settles, unifies, and becomes immersed in samadhi. And this is what I mean. It's strange, right? It's weird. How can you say it becomes stilled? We are already, it is already stilled. We are dealing with the jhana states here. We're dealing with very profound samadhi. And we can see that there seems to be a clash here. It doesn't really make sense anymore the way this is presented. And this is why I'm saying is that the jhanas seem to be some kind of later addition that don't really belong in this sutta in, the, in this way. So there seems to be a problem here. But anyway, it is always nice to read about the jhana states uh, because these are the things that we can all look forward to. Yeah, if you practice really fully and you uh, get your mind is kind of developing in the right way, eventually the jhanas are going to be there. Uh, and they're such beautiful, beautiful states. Uh, not only are they beautiful, but they are full of the potential for wisdom and understanding. Uh, so they're extraordinarily powerful and wonderful. Uh, and uh, just reading about them kind of makes you feel a bit of joy already. It lifts you up. Yeah, this is there for our taking. If we just keep on practicing in this way, eventually we have to get to these jhana states. There's something super duper attractive about that. Anyway, let's uh, carry on because this is uh, otherwise going to take too long. So let's move on to the next jhana state. Furthermore, as the placing of the mind and keeping it connected are stilled, a mendicant, a monastic, a layperson, whoever enters and remains in the second absorption, the second jhana, which has rapture and bliss born of samadhi with internal clarity and confidence and unified mind without placing the mind and keeping it connected her. They drench, steep, fill, and spread their body with rapture and bliss born of samadhi, of stillness. There is no part of the body that is not spread with the rapture and bliss born of samadhi. It is like a deep lake fed by a spring, by spring water. There is no inlet to the east, west, north, or south. There is no rainfall to replenish it from time to time. But the stream of cool water welling up in the lake drenches steeps, fills and spreads throughout the lake. There is no part of the lake that is not spread through with cool water. In the same way, a mendicant drenches, sleeps, fills, uh, and spreads their body with rapture and bliss born of samadhi. There is no part of the body that is not spread with rapture and bliss born of samadhi. That too is how a mendicant develops mindfulness of the body. So here you have a very similar kind of idea. Yeah, the idea of the spring is like a spring within the experience itself. It is like the experience of the second jhana develops these qualities all by itself. It comes from within the experience. There is nothing coming from outside. The external world is completely cut off. Yeah, there is no inlet either from the east or the west or the north or the south. There is no water coming from the rain or anything like that. It's a completely self-contained contained experience in the second jhana. There's no experience of the world outside. Furthermore, with the fading away of rapture, a monastic enters and remains in the third jhana, the third absorption. They meditate with equanimity, mindful and aware. This is Sati Sampajanya, by the way. Personally experiencing the bliss of which the noble ones declare. Equanimous and mindful, one meditates in bliss. They drench, steep, fill, and spread their body with bliss free of rapture. There is no part of the body that is not spread with the bliss free of rapture. It is like a pool with blue water 
sorry, with blue water lilies uh, and pink and white lotuses. Uh, some of them sprout and grow in the water without rising above it, uh, thriving underwater. Uh, from the tip to the root, they are drenched, steeped, filled, uh, and soaked in cool water. Uh, there is no part of them that is not soaked with cool water. Uh, in the same way, a mendicant drenches steep, fills, and spreads their body with a bliss free of rapture. There is no part of the body that is not spread with a bliss free of rapture. That too is how mendicant develops mindfulness of the body. So here we have the third jhana experience. Yeah? You will notice the translation here, they personally experience the bliss. And the personally here is the word kayena, literally, you could say, with the body. But as I mentioned before, it actually means with your personality, it means with your person. Yeah, you experience these things in this case. And again, the idea here is how you are completely immersed in this experience. You are completely within it. This experience is in fact all that you experience at this point. This is all you have. There is no world beyond this experience again. So again, the idea of the third jhana, very more and more blissful as you move through these particular jhana states. Furthermore, a mendicant gives up the pleasure and pain and ending former happiness and sadness, they enter and remain in the fourth absorption. Without pleasure or pain, with pure equanimity and mindfulness, uh, they sit spreading the body through with pure bright mind. There's no part of the body that's not filled with a pure bright mind. It is like someone sitting wrapped from head to foot with a white cloth. There's no part of the body that is not spread over with a white cloth. In the same way, they sit spreading their body through with a white bright, bright mind. There's no part of the body that is not filled with a pure bright mind. So here you have the culmination of the Buddhist path, yeah, going all the way to the fourth jhana state. And this is where you go to the point where you are giving up all the pleasure and the pain in the world reaching a state of pure equanimity. It is the mind reaching its most powerful point. Yeah, it is a pure, bright mind, ready to make the big breakthroughs that you require to go all the way to the end of the path to becoming an arahant. And it is like you are spread with this white cloth. Yeah, Whiteness here symbolizes the purity of your mind and your entire body is under this white cloth. You are within it. It spreads over you. There is no uh, part of you which is not filled with this beautiful uh, brightness of mind that comes from the fourth jhana state. As they meditate like this, yeah, uh, heedful, um, inspired and energetic, memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up. Yeah, to say the least, their mind becomes stilled internally, it settles, unifies, and becomes immersed in samadhi. That too is how a mendicant develops mindfulness of the body. So uh, there you are again, the four jhanas, they're always very beautiful just to read them out uh, and to allow yourself to be inspired by these things, uh, to know that this is where we are heading. This is the purpose of this path, yeah? Isn't that kind of extraordinary that this is the purpose of the path, uh, that we're heading to these extraordinary levels of bliss? Uh, but this is really where this path is going. Uh, so when we talk about meditation, we're still talking about really the preliminary parts of meditation, how to get the meditation going. Uh, but uh, here we're also seeing a little bit of the purpose of meditation, where eventually every one of us, I think, hopes to go as we practice this path in the right way. Uh, 
So that concludes the exercises in the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, the mindfulness directed at the body. And now we're going to look at some of the consequences of practicing in this way. So we're going to see what the Buddha has to say about the results of this kind of practice. And this is what he has to say. Anyone who has developed and cultivated mindfulness of body includes all of the skillful qualities that play a part in realization. Anyone who brings into, the, into their mind the great ocean includes all of the streams that run down into it. In the same way, anyone who has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body includes all the skillful qualities that play a part in realization. Yeah, this is a very kind of powerful statement about the idea of the mindfulness of the body. If you practice the mindfulness of the body in the right way, you bring into existence all of these good qualities. Yeah, and remember that the good qualities that we talk about are not just the giving up of defilements, the giving up of the unpleasant qualities of the mind, but it's also the development of all those qualities that are beautiful, that are desirable. Yeah, we're talking about the rapture of the body. We're talking about blissful experiences. When we give up the body in the right way, bliss happens as a matter of course. Yeah, so this is a kind of a very positive way of thinking about the mindfulness of the body. All of these things come about as a consequence of practicing in this way. The mindfulness of breathing, maybe the four element meditation, also the, uh, the, the um, uh, satisampajanya, the uh, uh, situational awareness, all of these things that build in that direction, eventually giving rise to all of these positive qualities that we have. Uh, so the Buddha then says, he says that uh, when a mendicant has not developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, Mara finds a vulnerability and gets hold of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, and then you have a simile here. Suppose a person were to throw a heavy stone ball on a mound of wet clay. What do you think, mendicants? Would that heavy stone ball find an entry into that mound of wet clay? Yes, sir. In the same way, when a mendicant, a monastic or a lay person, has not developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, Mara finds a vulnerability. Mara gets hold of them. Yeah, so it is almost like you can imagine that the mindfulness of the body is like armor. It's like a shield that you hold up against Mara. Mara, you cannot enter here because I have a shield that is more powerful than your armies. Yeah, you're blocking Mara out through this shield because the contemplation of the body, if you do it in the right way, it doesn't allow you really to give rise to too many unwholesome states. It blocks out the unwholesome states. And uh, this is a typical case where the right way to think about Mara here is to think about Mara as a psychological quality. Yeah? It is the psych psychological quality when we move around in the world uh, and we see the things of the world, then it tends to give rise to desires. It tends to give rise to ill will or aversion towards things. Uh, and this is the Mara of the world. Uh, yeah, this is the psychological qualities that arise in us as a consequence of our contact, our experience of the world. So what we do is we have the shield, we have the armor that is ready to fight <laughs> these negative qualities of the mind. And so we develop this armor and then Mara finds no vulnerability. Your armor is complete. There is no gap in your armor. There is no place for Mara's arrows to penetrate through your armor. And because of that, Mara cannot get hold of you. Mara is at a loss. Mara slinks away, as it says in the suttas. Mara disappears right on the spot. And Mara 
is sad and dejected and says, ah, oh, the mendicant knows me, the mendicant knows me. And then Mara just disappears and cannot actually achieve anything here. So Mara has this very interesting duality in Buddhism. On the one hand, Mara is like a real being that exists in the world. But the way that Mara is used in the suttas, usually it means like a psychological vulnerability. We are psychologically vulnerable to the defilements of the mind. And unless we develop the inner armor, the inner armor of having a strong mind, a mind that is founded on the body in this way, then we will have a problem as a consequence. This beautiful duality of Mara, this idea of being invulnerable, yeah, of being impregnable. And then you have the simile here of the stone ball yeah, on the met, wet mound of clay. Yeah. The stone sinks in to the clay, and this is the problem. In the same way, Mara gets access into your mind in the same way that the stone ball gets access into the mound of clay here. Suppose there was a dried up and withered log. Then a person comes along with a drill stick, thinking to light a fire and produce heat. What do you think, mendicants, by drilling the stick against the dried up withered log on dry land far from water, could they light a fire and produce heat? Yes, sir. In the same way, when a mendicant has not developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, Mara finds a vulnerability and gets hold of them. Yeah, so this is the ancient way of producing fire when you have a dry piece of wood and then you have another piece of wood and you rub that piece of wood and you rub the two pieces of wood against each other yeah you move the wood back and forth by rolling the wood in your hands and then you produce heat at the bottom and in this way you produce a spark and eventually you create fire in this way but this can only be done if the wood is really dry. It has to be very dry wood. Only then can you produce fire in this particular way by uh, you know, using the ancient technique that was used a long, long time ago. In the same way, Mara produces fire inside of us. Yeah, the fire of desire, the fire of aversion and ill will. This is produced by Mara when the raging fires inside of us take hold of the mind. And I'm sure you know what, it, what that can feel like. Sometimes when the desire becomes very strong, it feels a bit like you are on fire. The Buddha calls this fire in the suttas. We are on fire with greed, hatred, and delusion, the Buddha says, because the mind is restless. The mind is agitated. The mind is flicking, just like a flame is always moving and flicking. In the same way, the agitation is the fire inside of our minds. And this is what we stop, yeah, by having the mindfulness of the body practiced in the right way here. So these are some uh, beautiful similes. Uh, I will stop there because there is still quite a bit left of this sutta. So I will come back to this uh, after uh, lunch. Let us have another short little meditation break and then we'll come back to the uh, questions in a, couple, in a few minutes. So.